Hey, today we're going to be talking about GI disorders. It will be in your book in Chapter 44, your MedSearch book. So caring for clients with GI disorders. First, we're going to break it up and we're going to talk a little bit about some AMP and talk initially about the upper GI. So upper GI is going to consist of the mouth, the saliv salivary glands. Um, they create secrete amylase. Amylase is something that is also going to be found in your pancreas, and basically it just breaks down starches into those simple sugars. Next is the pharynx, and it goes on down into the esophagus. The esophagus is at the base of the pharynx, and it moves food by peristalsis. Or per peristalsis. After that, it goes into the stomach. In the stomach, it stores food. It breaks it down into a liquid substance. It uses hydrochloric acid, and it will digest those proteins using the enzymes pepsin. It contains the cardiac sphincter, which is going to be the opening between the esophagus and the stomach, right in that area. And then you have the fundus of the stomach, the body, the pylorus, and the pyloric sphincter. Now, on newborn babies, sometimes you'll hear um, about pyloric stenosis. This is when this is too tight, and they can go in and they can do surgery to open that up and allow the food to travel through. But with pyloric stenosis, you're going to find that babies have projectile vomiting. The food will hit right here, and then it will come up, and it will projectile out. So, pyloric sphincter right there. Stomach enzymes, pepsid. Pepsin is going to break down the protein. Gastric lipase will break down triglycerides. Hydrochloric acid is going to break down proteins. And then you'll also have the intrinsic factor, which is going to absorb um, vitamin B12. B12, you know, helps with the production of red blood cells. And if we are deficient in B12, which is created in the stomach, we'll have pernicious perinaceous anemia, and that just means that we're going to have this anemia, not enough red blood cells, and it's all caused by stomach, not enough B12. So in the small intestine, after we go through the stomach, we um, the pyloric sphincter, we go straight into the small intestine, and the primary function of the small intestine is going to be to absorb all these nutrients. You go from the duodenum to the jejunum to the ileum. Food in this uh, intestine is going to be semi-solid in the duodenum, and then it breaks down into a liquid when it reaches that ileum. From here, we go into the large intestine, and the large intestine's primary function is going to be absorbing all that excess water, electrolytes, bile acids from the body and moving the waste on out of the body. You have a normal bacterial flora that is found um, in the large intestine, and it breaks down substances as well. Structurally, we're going to look at it, and it's going to be the ileocecal valve, the cecum the appendix, the ascending colon, on into the transverse colon, which goes across, and then the descending coming down, which is connected to the sigmoid, the rectum, and the anus. So you can see right here, we have our stomach up top. Here's our pyloric sphincter. Going on into the small intestine, the small intestine is very large, has lots of tubules, um, wrapping around, going on through. And then we connect right here, ileocecal valve, the cecum, appendix is right down here. Sometimes this will get removed, we're not entirely sure of what the function is there. Goes on up into the ascending colon, the transverse colon goes across comes down into the descending colon to the sigmoid, rectum, and the anus. The peritoneum is a membrane that encloses the inner abdomen and allows organs to kind of move about freely without causing too much friction, but it's basically just a sac that encloses all those inner abdomens. Anytime any kind of damage occurs to any other organs within, it may allow some leakage of gastric or intestinal fluid into that peritoneal cavity, and this can cause inflammation and infection. When it is called, whenever we have this inflammation or infection, it is called peritonitis. And one of the most common causes of peritonitis is going to be peritoneal dialysis, whenever they're doing dialysis through the stomach. Any kind of infection can cause it, and it can be pretty serious. So, 
Now we can talk about the liver a little bit. The liver is going to form and release bile. It processes vitamins, proteins, fats, carbs. It really has um, a lot of large jobs. The gallbladder is going to receive some bile from the liver, so you can see where it's connected. It concentrates it, and it's released when the food is ingested, so that bile is going to help break down that food. The pancreas is triggered by bile as well, and it releases digestive enzymes, those lipase, amylase. If it has A-S-E at the end of the word, a lot of times those are the digestive enzymes that are released from the pancreas. Okay, general assessment of that. GI system. So when we are looking at someone and we're trying to do an assessment of the GI system, we're going to be looking um, for their chief complaint. And that's true anytime a patient comes in. What is bringing them in? What's their chief complaint? So we'll go through current symptoms and the durations. How long is it, it lasted? When did it start? What are you feeling? Do they have any food allergies? You know, food allergies are often a very um, normal cause of any kind of diarrhea or vomiting. So we want to make sure to kind of rule that out before we start looking at real problems. Did they eat something that they just shouldn't have? Are they lactose intolerant, ate dairy that night? Do they have a gluten allergy? So we're going to kind of look through that. Medical history, what is their medical history? Do they have a surgery history? We've got to get down to the bottom of that. Alcohol intake, are they drinkers? Do they have a history of smoking? What is their family history? And then we look at weight loss or weight gain. Are they gaining weight? Are they losing a whole lot of weight? Sometimes they're not absorbing nutrients, so we want to know and look at that as well. Elimination pattern. Do they have chronic diarrhea or chronic constipation? We have to ask those questions. Have they had appetite changes? They're not wanting to eat anything lately. Their stomach's just been bothering them a lot. Nausea and vomiting. That's often what's going to bring them in initially. Maybe difficulty chewing, intolerance to certain foods. They just can't tolerate them at all. It bothers them every time they eat it. They're having a horrible amount of pain. Maybe it's gnawing pain. Maybe it's cramping. Uh, we need to ask them, does it occur with meals? Describe the pain. What kind of pain is it? Is that gnawing pain? Is it that cramping pain? Does it just feel like it's sharp and shooting? Does it radiate? Does it move anywhere else? You can click here and get my classic tummy problems video. Um, general assessment of the GI system. So, physical assessment, we're going to be looking at their final signs, their weight, their height, general appearance. Do they look healthy? What's their hygiene? Their skin t c color, their turgor. You know, when someone's not feeling well, a lot of times they're going to lose um, color in their face. And hematoemesis. Are they throwing up and is there blood in their emesis? Stomatit stomatitis, inflammation of the mouth, dysphagia. Are they having problems swallowing, chewing? Are they having hemorrhoids? Do they have abdomen distension? Is their abdomen really protruding out? Any kind of edema or ascites there? And then we also look for abdomen aortic pal palpitations, pulsations. And if you have aortic pulse, pulsations, it could be from um, a couple of things. It could be hypertension, aortic insufficiency, not enough blood going through, or maybe even aneurysms. And that is going to cause a decrease in the femoral pulse if there is an aneurysm. Not enough blood being circulated. That blood is going elsewhere into that aneurysm. It's not going into that femoral pulse. So general assessment of the GI systems, bowel sounds normal as anything 5 to 30 times a minute. So we expect to hear a lot of bowel sounds. We're always going to auscultate before palpating the abdomen. Always, always, always look, listen, then feel, and it has to be in that order. We don't want to go feeling on their stomach first off and shake things up. We want to look, listen, then feel. Listen for 5 minutes before charting absent bowel sounds. So if you're going to chart um, absent bowel sounds, you better have listened to all four quadrants five minutes. That's 20 minutes a piece. You're not going to see too many nurses um, do that with their assessments. Usually assessments don't last that full 20 minutes. But for absent bowel sounds, you want to listen to a full five minutes. We're going to do the location, which we um, 
label it right lower quadrant, right upper, left upper quadrant, left lower. So it'll be LLQ or right upper quadrant, RUQ. Um, the pitch of it, the quality of it. We're going to also be measuring abdomen girth to see, are they retaining fluid there? Are they having some abdomen distension, some ascites there? So we'll be measuring the abdomen girth, and of course we always measure at that same point, right at that belly button. Okay, whenever you are listening, we start at the right lower quadrant and we work our way up and over. So anytime you're listening in your assessment, always start at that right lower quadrant, move up to the right upper quadrant, left upper, in the left lower. Okay, we're looking at stool changes. Melena, tarry stool, GI hemorrhage, clay, whitish color. And this could mean, usually it's going to mean that there is some kind of involvement with the liver, whether it's cirrhosis. Uh, froggy, foamy, foul smelling stool is often indicative of pancreatitis. They might have current jelly stools, mucus and mud, blood mixed in with it. Could have blood ulcerations, hemorrhaging, it could be frank bleeding, bright red, or it could be old bleeding and turn more blackish and look tarry look. Diarrhea means there's probably an infection, irritable bowel syndrome, malabsorption of fat. Anytime there's any kind of changes or shape in the stool, looking at certain foods, medications can alter the color, so we have to make sure we're monitoring and looking for all that and asking the right questions. We're going to end it right here, and we will talk about diagnostic tests next.